Quiero presentar al doctor Alan Yang, quien es eh, Marjorie Brofman Professor en Estudios Sociales en Medicina en el Departamento de Estudios Sociales de Medicina de McGill University. El doctor Alan Yang se referirá a la tesis de la heterogeneidad, nueva luz en la epistemología de los desórdenes postraumáticos. Doctor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I want to express my gratitude uh, for uh, being invited uh, to come here. Uh, I will do my best to, to give the talk uh, within the half hour. Uh, if uh, you want to get a better look at uh, the talk, at the end of next week I will post a, uh, a PDF uh, of a long paper. Uh, in which all the details are spelled out. And, uh, okay, so uh, uh, I apologize for, my, I have a lot of apologies. First of all, for my uh, voice, the fact, uh, number two, that I am giving this talk in English and not in Spanish. And number three, I should not say this, uh, that I'm an anthropologist, I'm not a, uh, uh, a clinician. And uh, the, the paradox of an anthropologist speaking to an audience like this is that on the one hand, what I have to say is going to be too abstract, and on the other hand, it's going to be too concrete, uh, but is the best that I can do. And, oh, good. Uh, the, uh, and I'm going to be speaking about uh, PTSD. Uh, and is a very common, as you know, so far as the prevalence goes in North America, the fourth most common uh, uh, diagnosis. And almost everything that we know about PTSD and research that's been done on PTSD has been on chronic uh, PTSD, going on for more than uh, six months. Uh, what makes chronic PTSD particularly interesting is the high level, high prevalence of comorbidity. And not only comorbidity, but comorbid with diagnoses that have exactly the same symptoms uh, as PTSD. And this has been uh, commented on uh, 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 numerous times. What makes PTSD distinctive uh, is its etiology, and unlike other DSM uh, categories. And that etiology, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is the etiology of traumatic memory. And I'll have a lot to say about want to harp uh, uh, upon that. Uh, and I'm going to explore the theme of the heterogeneity of PTSD uh, with an example that you will not welcome. Uh, and that example, I want to look at it through the medium uh, of an epidemic, a kind of a hidden epidemic uh, that's taking place amongst U.S. war veterans. And the reason I say will not be welcome is that we've come here today to hear talks on global mental health, uh, and I've chosen a patient population that is highly uh, uh, specific. But I hope that by the time I get to the end of the talk, I will have justified uh, spending your time uh, talking about U.S. war veterans. Okay, first of all, I, I want to underline my uh, uh, starting uh, opening statement about the primacy of etiology, which really sets PTSD off for most psychiatric uh, classifications. And if we look, myself as an anthropologist, I always want ethnographic evidence. And if we look of evidence of the importance of etiology with regards to uh, the psychiatric perspective uh, on PTSD, the best place to look is at the so-called gold standard. What is recognized as the best practice? Gold standard regarding diagnosis, gold standard uh, regarding treatment. And the goal, uh, the, oops. Uh, and the uh, gold standard, uh, sorry, uh, 
Uh, here I, I've put on, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, is a, a scale, uh, a clinician minister PTSD scale, and it's a scale that is built around eliciting from uh, the patient a single index uh, event, one trauma, and everything that follows focuses on the memory uh, of that trauma. The, today, the, the gold standard for the Veterans Administration in the U.S. and private practice as well is prolonged exposure therapy. And prolonged exposure therapy likewise is focused on an index trauma. That is to say, a memory of a, uh, a particular traumatic event. So that's the justification for my uh, uh, conclusion. And I hope that uh, I frame this in a way that will be interesting of a mystery story. A mystery story <coughs> with a solution. A false solution, and maybe a promising solution. And the mystery story is the one that I, I've put here. And it's a mystery story that has been unfolding for the last 15, 16 years. If we uh, keep in mind that the Veterans Administration medical system in the United States is by far and away the single largest social medicine system uh, in North America, not only uh, in the United States, uh, a very interesting development. For U.S. veterans receiving disability compensation for health problems, increased over those uh, decade and a half by 12%. However, with regards to PTSD, it starts off at a base that's colossal in terms of the amounts of money uh, that are expended billions of dollars annually, and it has increased at 80%, so uh, obviously disproportionate. That's not the mystery. The mystery begins at this point. The mystery is, this is an epidemic, not simply of war veterans. The U.S. has managed to get in a lot of wars uh, over the last uh, 50 years. Almost all of the increase comes from a single war, and that is the Vietnam War, uh, which ended uh, officially and unofficially in 1974. Therefore, if we look at this uh, the rise in diagnoses, almost all of them are new diagnoses, men who have not received previous psychiatric uh, diagnoses, and there are examples of what is called long-delayed onset PTSD, which some of us think six months, a year maybe, but this is long-delayed of uh, between 30 and 40 years of men being asymptomatic and then uh, receiving the diagnosis. How many men? At this point, it's over a quarter of a million uh, diagnoses uh, within this epidemic. So it's not a little epidemic, and if you count it in terms of an important metric, the metric of money, it is an epidemic of many billions, not millions, uh, but billions uh, of dollars. Now, what is puzzling about this uh, uh, development is actually this long-delayed onset PTSD, so-called, amongst war veterans is previously relatively uh, rare. And in this case, it is further mysterious by the fact that the diagnosis does not correspond to combat exposure. So that many of these men, perhaps the bulk of these men, have seen either no combat or very, very little combat. So it's hard to understand exactly what's going on. One explanation was that we're seeing the aging brain. As the brain ages, these men, these veterans, become more vulnerable. In fact, empirical research on aging brain amongst veterans shows exactly the opposite. So this really doesn't work. The puzzle is further compounded when we look at the treatment pattern uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, these men, this uh, uh, long uh, uh, delayed uh, onset, the typical patient 
continues going for treatment, perhaps twice a week, once a, uh, a week, even though his condition worsens. So the, 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 the conformance to a, a, a rigorous treatment program uh, 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 continues even though the condition worsens. Of course, as the condition worsens, the disability uh, uh, worsens. And men continue uh, uh, typically until the disability rating reaches 100%, that is to say, uh, their symptoms become most uh, uh, salient, and then they stop. So it is a mystery if you're living on Mars and looking down, uh, it's a mystery as to what's going on. The people to turn to, and the Veterans Administration has, are labor economists, and to ask what is special uh, about this patient population. And what is special about this patient population is that these are veterans who have got very limited vocational skills. Uh, they have a limited ability uh, to make a decent living. And especially after 2008 and the economic downturn, uh, their conditions are fairly miserable. So the conclusion has been, and this is really my starting point, which seems to be uh, a commonsensical uh, conclusion. Uh, the conclusion is this is an epidemic, not a PTSD, but an epidemic of malingering. That is to say, these men uh, are simply lying. And malingering, of course, is a, a, a conscious uh, deception, uh, deception that can occur uh, in a variety uh, uh, of ways. Okay, let me uh, move on. I wanted to give an example from the beginning of uh, uh, what we could call PTSD, but I, I will skip that. Uh, and let me uh, move on to what the conventional perspective, the, the, the prevalent uh, perspective uh, on traumatic memory uh, is that traumatic memory is a distinctively indelible object. And this term indelible recurs over and over again, what distinguishes traumatic memories uh, from uh, ordinary memories. Uh, we have a history of metaphors uh, in the PTSD uh, literature describing this, a videotape, a flashback, uh, and so on today, a DVD, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and it is interesting that this emphasis on a single event and the idea that the event is indelible is a response not to a psychiatric imperative. If we look back at the history from 1980 on, when it's first inscribed in DSM-3, but it's a response to a forensic uh, imperative. That is the entitlement of veterans to uh, psychiatric care, free psychiatric care, uh, and to uh, compensation. So it's driven by a forensic imperative that has remained over the last three and a half decades as powerful uh, as the psychiatric uh, imperative. Now, uh, there's another way uh, of uh, looking at the memory, not as a discrete object, something that is uh, concrete. It is possible, we know in memory science, uh, to look at memory not as an object, but rather uh, as a, a process. Uh, this idea is, in fact, a rather old idea. It certainly goes back to the 1920s, 1930s, uh, associated with a famous a great a British psychologist, uh, Frederick uh, uh, Bartlett, uh, in, uh, uh, with, regards to, uh, uh, with regards to this. And uh, uh, it has been, uh, I, I will make the point, uh, further strengthened this uh, second vision uh, of memory by recent developments over the last two decades uh, in neuroscience, and particularly in the neuroscience, uh, uh, neuroscience of uh, memory uh, in this regard. Okay. And I want to give you some 
interesting quotations, but I, I'll skip over that of people uh, uh, making uh, this point. Uh, and really, what the, the, the conclusion, I'll just get down to the, the bottom line, uh, is that memories of the past uh, really are memories of the past, but they're memories for the future. That is to say, they're templates and in influence behavior. They're routinely uh, recontextualized and, and so on. OK, I don't want to dwell on this point in my paper. I, I do dwell uh, on the point. But I want to pull your attention to, again, a part of the puzzle. Uh, and the part of the puzzle is that these are rather old ideas. They precede developments in uh, 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 functional neuroimaging. Uh, the so-called neuroscience revolution. They go back to the 1920s and 1930s, and there have been recurrent uh, epidemiological studies within psychiatry in which they've resurfaced, but always marginalized, always disappear. It's almost as if the exceptions are regarded exactly as that exceptional, something to be put uh, to uh, the margin. Uh, this marginalization of the vision of memory, not as a thing, but rather as a process and traumatic memory, as a, just another example uh, uh, of this process, has been revived. And revived in a way that is unavoidable, cannot be marginalized. And that is through a neuroscience. Now, I'm not, I hope I will be clear, I'm not advocating a, a, a reductionist vision of PTSD and saying, uh, I'm here to bring you the news that all the answers are in neuroscience. To the contrary. <coughs> However, within the uh, structure of how we make knowledge, and how we regard the, the theories as being legitimate, obviously the brain plays uh, an important uh, role. Uh, and uh, this uh, rival vision has arised. And the conclusion is, well, maybe the problem that we've had with PTSD up to this point is that we've had the wrong brain. We, being researchers, epidemiologists, have had the wrong brain, and we need a new brain. And the new brain is the Bayesian brain, one that is probabilistic rather than categorical in its understanding uh, of psychiatric uh, classifications. And uh, an important person in this regard has been Carl Friston, but I'll skip over Friston uh, and uh, memory uh, and just segue to the, the, the conclusion. And the emerging conclusion that every memory of the past is simultaneously a memory of the future. And despite a long history of now 25, uh, 35 years, uh, uh, rather, traumatic memory is no different from any other kind uh, of memory uh, in this uh, regard. Now, uh, uh, again, it's very interesting to, to, to look back at the past. I said, go back to 1932 and look at Bartlett's famous book, Remembering, regarded at the time as a monument, and then forgotten. Uh, uh, if we look in 1987, a landmark study uh, was undertaken by researchers uh, at Yale and uh, Harvard University uh, veterans of the uh, first Gulf War, 59 men. And the important uh, uh, findings uh, are in the, in the, the last, what, three uh, paragraphs. Uh, after uh, two years, 70% uh, uh, of the men reported experiences, exposures uh, to trauma that they had not reported uh, in the uh, initial interview, uh, and the events that they uh, described uh, for the first time uh, are objectively described severe uh, events, not subjectively experienced events. Uh, and here are typical of the events that, that they reported seeing uh, on the second time around uh, bizarre disfiguration of bodies as a result of wounds, seeing people killed and wounded, extreme threat to your own 
They didn't report that as soon as they returned. They didn't uh, return to uh, explain that in the field. And this was an interesting population because they were not making disability claims. We can say in a way that they were innocent of the, uh, the malingering claim. But something strange was taking place. What's interesting about this article uh, published in, in you know, we have it at the bottom if you, you, you cannot uh, read the, the uh, date. Well, it was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, is completely marginalized, forgotten. The, 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 the research is, uh, in a sense, never uh, cited again. But again, is a vindication of the idea that there's something odd about these uh, traumatic uh, uh, memories. The authors offer a solution to the article, the solution. And the solution they give in 1987 is precisely uh, the solution that we have from neuroscience, from Friston, writing in 2016, that there's a regular updating, that the, there's a process, not a thing, uh, that these uh, memory traces uh, become templates for the future, and so on and so forth, that have enormous psychiatric uh, uh, significance. Uh, at the same time, there are important developments taking place uh, with regards to neuroscience and what I described uh, as the new brain. I'm sorry to have no time to talk about this, but it uh, really boils down to the discovery of a new network within the, the, the brain. I'm going to say a new organ in the brain, uh, the so-called default mode network. Uh, which I, I, I suppose everyone is familiar with, but also begins with uh, a very interesting puzzle. And that puzzle is, what is the brain doing when it's doing nothing? And when we look at what the brain is doing when it's doing nothing, it's consuming enormous amounts of energy. In fact, it is harder at work when it's doing nothing than when it's doing something, that is, uh, engage in some uh, overt task-directed uh, 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 activity. And this uh, default mode network is today regarded as perhaps the site at which the most important memory processing uh, is uh, taking place. Again, this potentially has uh, very great influences for our understanding uh, of uh, traumatic memory because I open my talk by talking about the heterogeneity of uh, uh, PTSD, and you could say, well, this only an anthropologist could discover it. Well, of course, that's not true. Everyone's known about the heterogeneity of PTSD. Uh, it is a problem that has plagued the epidemiologists and forensic specialists uh, within the PTSD community uh, for 35 years. The question is what to do with it? What is the solution? to the heterogeneity problem. And for most of them, when they're talking about a solution, what is the solution to finding, detecting false negatives and false positives? And the obvious solution is the solution that lies within the, uh, the brain uh, and the nervous system. Uh, and if we look at that 35-year period or 30-year period, before the advent of functional neuroimaging, a number of candidates have emerged. Uh, the first of these, and the most popular, which is an enormous amount uh, of research, is there's something distinctive about PTSD regarding the functioning of the HPA axis. After 35 years, it's panned out to be nothing. Uh, I mean, nothing convincing, at least, I think, to outsiders, but not to insiders. Uh, another candidate is because uh, of the memory uh, focus of PTSD. Uh, there's something about the hippocampus uh, in PTSD that is a distinguishing figure. And for a while, uh, this was very popular, and the initial result was to, to discover that indeed amongst men uh, diagnosed with uh, PTSD, uh, there is a statistically significant uh, a difference in the size of the hippocampus from those men with similar exposures and so on. 
The problem was, as soon as twin studies were involved, it was discovered that the twin who never went to Vietnam, who never went in the army, who stayed home and continued going to school, also had a small hippocampus relative. So that didn't work out. The only thing that has worked out in a way that seems to be convincing uh, involves recent research on neuroimaging uh, of the uh, uh, of the default uh, mode network. And again, I just rush through this very quickly. And the only two words to look at here are uh, uh, the, the end of this first line, uh, reduce connectivity. There's something distinctive about what's going on during this uh, uh, activities of the default mode network that may, in fact, um, what might be going on, the last paragraph uh, summarizes uh, what it is. And now I come at the, the moment, I think a lot of people are waiting for my conclusion and also uh, my justification for talking about all of these aging uh, Vietnam War veterans in Santiago, Chile, uh, in this case. And the point that I want to make and is subject of a, a, a recent publication by me, Naomi Breslau, is that every diagnostic classification has a history. We know that. That's not news. However, the post-traumatic syndromes, including PTSD, are historical in a special sense. And that history is not external to psychiatry. It's internal to our understanding and internal uh, to the uh, classification. And uh, in, in just a very quick summary, that if we look at the history uh, of PTSD and the ongoing at present day, uh, uh, the history of PTSD is the history of a series of episodes, and episodes associated with epidemics of various sorts, epidemics of PTSD. Most of those uh, epidemics stimulated uh, by uh, wars. And again, I have no time to, 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 to justify this. I think it's very easy uh, to justify. But here I've listed a number of episodes that follow this, uh, that uh, uh, of episodes followed by epidemics uh, of PTSD, epidemics in terms of numbers of uh, men and women who are diagnosed uh, uh, with a disorder. Now, the point I want to make about this, I'm coming to the very end now, each of these episodes is associated with characteristic symptoms and subjectivity. Subjectivity is the, the clinical experience of the, the, the clini clinical phenomenology uh, of the disorder. And here I've listed the, the, the famous ones that you know, shell shock, PTSD, mild uh, traumatic brain uh, uh, injury, Gulf War syndrome, distant trauma, second generation Holocaust trauma. Uh, that's the beginning of the list. It's a, a, a very long list. And not only is it a list of uh, different diagnoses, but also a list of very nicely uh, uh, studied symptom clusters that change over time, that disappear, that recur from one episode uh, to the, the next in, in this regard. And now I come to the very uh, uh, end. Uh, and that is uh, uh, with regards to these uh, uh, episodes. And just to make a point that they're linked through diffusion and reinterpreted and so on. And now I, I want to come to just the, the very, very end when I said I would justify uh, talking uh, about these. If I've accomplished one thing, I think that we could reach a consensus uh, of everyone here, is I've given an account of PTSD that is very complicated. We say heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is another way of talking uh, about complexity. There are three ways, I think, to respond, to interpret, to my account, uh, that is, of uh, this complexity. One way is the conventional way, and that, I would say, would be a hegemonic response. 
and to say, look, with this guy young, an anthropologist, what are you asking him for? Uh, you should ask me, a specialist in PTSD, a Muslim or a specialist in PTSD, associated with the Veterans Administration in the US, in North America at least, uh, ask me, and I will tell you that our understanding of PTSD is one that is predicated on our experience with the Vietnam War and the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And there is a justification for that. And the justification is that the definition, the landmark definition of PTSD, which enters in DSM-3, was designed specifically by the members of the committee to satisfy the needs of Vietnam War veterans in a kind of a crisis, a clinical crisis uh, affecting uh, these men at the time. I interviewed all the members of the committee. I know some of them well, and it's quite clear, and there's much to, to justify the claim I've met. So one response to complexity, i.e. heterogeneity, is a hegemonic response. The second response is the response that I think a lot of people, perhaps everybody here except for me, uh, has adopted. And that is, you say complexity, I say confusion. Uh, and I think that what you've uh, demonstrated, if you've demonstrated anything, is how confusing the clinical phenomenology uh, of PTSD. I think that there's a third response. And the third response is that PTSD gives us, or at least the history of PTSD, an opportunity. An opportunity with the help and the assistance uh, of developments in uh, uh, neuroscience, and particularly brain imaging uh, in this regard, uh, a portal onto a reconception of many of the assumptions that we've made until now and particularly assumptions about the relationship between memory uh, and the self. So that's it, more or less half an hour, and I thank you for your patience. <laughs>